Okay. Okay. So, so what genocide is in short? It's actually a pretty new term. Uh, the term was coined by an international lawyer named Rafael Lemkin, who was born in the Russian Empire in what is now northeastern Belarus, near the town of Volkovysk. But, but he grew up in Poland. He graduated from Lviv University, where he, he started his career, then moved to Warsaw, worked for the Ministry of Justice in Poland, and in 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, he managed to escape and ended up in the United States, where he taught law at Duke University. And from the very beginning of the war, Lemkin started collecting various legal documents or German Nazi regulations and laws throughout Europe, and in 1944, he published a book called Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, in which he coined the term genocide, which came from a connection of two words. One is a Greek word, geno, for people, and another side from Latin killing. So essentially, genocide is the murder of a people, and that's where the term was born, he spent the rest of his life lobbying for the recognition of the term. The term was not something that, you know, that uh, trials of Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg dealt with, it was mentioned, but it was not something that, that uh, Nazi criminals accused in Nuremberg stood for trial for. But in 1948, the United Nations finally ratified a convention for the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide, which defined genocide as act committed with the intent to destroy in whole in part parts of national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such and gave a list of actions that would constitute genocide, including killing members of the group and causing bodily harm, but also actions that would not involve any killing at all, like transferring children from one group to another or to preventing birth within the group. So, so and that's important because there are many myths and many misconceptions about what genocide is. Genocide is not about numbers, right? It doesn't really matter how many people killed according to this convention because the criteria is in whole, which almost never really happens, but most importantly, in part. So it's not about numbers and it's also not about actual physical violence. It rarely happens, but we can also imagine a situation in which nobody is killed. But there is a mass sterilization campaign of males that prevents the group from reproducing or from women from having children. That would also be considered a genocide, even though technically no one is being killed. So the goal or the key criteria is the intent to destroy a group as such and the method of targeting. But it's not, about, it's not about numbers. You know, in our, in our mind and in public discussions, especially, you know, for, especially right now when we discuss uh, the Russian violence in Ukraine, many people say, well, you know, it's not the Holocaust in which six millions were killed. It's not Rwanda in which one million people were killed. But Actually, for genocide to be a gen for something to be a genocide, numbers do not matter. What matters is an intent to destroy a group as such and a mode of targeting. And this definition became legally, legally accepted throughout most of the countries in the world, and that's the definition that we have to work with, even though this definition has several pretty big problems that I will touch upon in a moment. So what are the key problems of this definition? Well, first of all, to prove genocide, you need to prove intent. It's in the definition. Actions committed with the intent to destroy a group in whole in part. 
Now, usually people engaged in genocide are not stupid. They know that there might be consequences for their actions. So they will either not put or not have any written orders. For instance, in the case of the Holocaust, historians spend decades trying to find a clear order written or signed by Hitler that would say explicitly kill all the Jews or to destroy all the Jews in Europe. They couldn't find it and most likely it doesn't even exist. Because orders, if they're given, they're given orally or they're presented in a very bureaucratic language without using the word. Killing can may, may be interpreted in many ways, or the archives are simply closed, such as in the case of Turkey and the Armenian genocide. Whatever might have been said, most likely, we will never know as long as archives in Turkey are closed. Yet, to prove a genocide or to label something a genocide, you need to prove this intent, which is especially true for legal proceedings. If you want to, be, to put people in jail for the crime of genocide, you need a proof of intent. Now, for historians or social scientists, it might be easier. We might look as a campaign as a whole and say, well, yes, there is enough indirect evidence of intent by looking at what leaders say, what is written in the media, but that would not work for criminal crimes. So if we want people to put people in jail, we need to prove an intent. And that's why quite a few international lawyers are very cautious of using the term genocide, including when it comes to the Russian violence in Ukraine. They say, you know, given what we have, we will not, we, we will likely not never have enough to clear the legal threshold of intent. So that's one problem. How do we prove intent? Another problem is what exactly do we mean by in whole in part, right? In whole is pretty clear, but in whole almost never happens. But what is in part? What does it mean? There is no clear threshold here that the UN convention gave us. Are we talking, of, and we don't even know how to measure it. whether we should measure it just in the number, absolute number of people affected or in percentages. And that is important because groups obviously differ in their size. So, and mass violence or an act of a violent campaign that affects a million of Chinese would have a very different impact on the survival of the group than a campaign that, that affects a similar number of people of a much smaller range especially when we're talking about very small indigenous groups that count in the hundreds or, or thousands. But if we look at percentages, then if killing even one or two members of the group might constitute a genocide for those small groups, and you will get, and you will have to target tens of millions in the case of very large groups. So this, so we do not know when exact, when, what is the point where just random individual low level violence stops and the genocide begins. And another reason of this definition is why those four groups, racial, ethnical, national, or religious. And there is absolutely no good intellectual reason to have these groups. There, but not other groups, and some of those groups I mentioned you know, at the beginning of the discussion, like language groups or gender groups or age groups, or even more importantly, political groups. Now, why those four groups? Well, we know why. Because the convention is, after all, a political document that has been agreed upon by the permanent members of the Security Council. And those are the groups that they were willing to see as victims of genocide. Originally, Lemkin and some others pushed very hard to include political groups in this definition, because after all, genocide is a political crime, but the Soviet, so, but the Soviet Union objected, precisely because Soviet Union in late 1948 was very, nine, sorry, 1940s, was busy targeting people because of their political affiliation. 
and did not want to be accused of genocide. So the political, the political label was dropped, but again, analytically or intellectually, there is absolutely no reason to have those four groups on. The genocide label was not the only one out there and not the only attempt to deal with mass violence in the aftermath of World War II. The main alternative was another term that many people are familiar with, crimes against humanity, which has been called by, by Herr Schlauterpach, who is also connected to Ukraine and Lviv. He, he was born in Zhovkova, which is now in Lviv Oblast, grew up in Lviv, and, when, and then went to the UK to continue his, his education. In, the, in this race between, race quote unquote, between crimes against humanity and genocide, Lemkin's term won the day and it became the focus of the UN Convention, but later crimes against humanity became a part of the Rome Statute that established the International Criminal Court. And crimes against humanity do not focus on specific group targeting. They do not need evidence of intent or attempts to annihilate a group as such. It just about modes of mass organized killing, enslavement, sexual violence, deportation. The list is long what you have here. I just several of those. So those are the key, those are the key differences. Genocide is about targeting and trying to destroy group as such. People are being targeted because of their group affiliation and group identity. The louder part and crimes against humanity, group affiliation doesn't matter. It's not about destroying groups, it's about targeting individuals. There is another alternative, which are atrocity crimes, which is a more recent term, much more broader that came into being with a new concept called responsibility to protect and attempt to stop genocide by assigning the responsibility to protect civilians, not to states, but to international community. And those atrocity crimes include genocide, include war crimes, include crime against humanity, rape, uh, ethnic cleansing. And most likely, if Russian perpetrators of violence against civilians in Ukraine are ever brought to trial, my guess is that that's what they will be, what will be tried for not genocide, because genocide will be very hard to prove, especially when it comes to intent, but crimes against humanity and especially atrocity crimes, which is a much broader term. And then the final alternative is what is called extremely violent societies. And that term, that idea comes from an historian, from a Swiss historian, Christian Gerlach, who published a book about 10 years ago with the same title, and his argument is very simple. The genocide is just one explanation, but it's just one crime, but those crimes rarely happen in isolation. So if we look at the case of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, we, we all know about the killing of the Jews, but at the same time, there was also very centralized, very deliberate murder of millions of Soviet prisoners of war, or homosexuals, or black Germans, or Jehovah Witnesses. And those two are connected. So trying to explain the murder of the Jews just by focusing on that makes no sense. We need to look at what's going on at the society as a whole. And he has several features of those extremely violent societies. Many victims, not just one group for one reason, but many victims, many perpetrators, many causes of violence. Some kill because of their group affiliation 
or ideology, some kill because they were ordered to, some kill because they want to get rich. So there are many different causes for many, targeting many different victims by many different perpetrators and very high levels of violence, not just against one targeted community, but in general. Those are societies that have high levels of violence, high levels of murders, high levels of crime. And presumably when we look at, you know, around us, we might discuss Russia as an extremely violent society. Yes, of course, we have the murder of civilians in Ukraine, but there are also, there are also many different violent campaigns and types of violence being perpetrated by Russians for different reasons in Russia, in Ukraine, in Chechnya, you name it. So what we need to understand is not just the leader and their thinking, but a society as a whole. The problem is the society, not just this or that leader or more general, or more general political parties. So those are the definitions. Right now, of course, the genocide is the most important one. Genocide is the term that most people are familiar with, partly because there is a convention, partly because it's a catchy term that is easy to explain, as easy to understand, compared to more general things like atrocity crimes, which are very broad and imprecise, but it doesn't mean, but there was nothing inevitable about us focusing on genocide, you know, with different constellation of forces and Lemkin being probably a bit less active. In 1940s, we, there is a good chance that crimes against humanity would have been, you know, as prominent and even more prominent than the crime of genocide. So that's, but that's essentially in short what genocide is an organized attempt to a need to destroy a group because of its identity. Now, what causes genocide? Obviously, there are many arguments and many and many different and many different explanations. I will focus on the on those that are more relevant to the current to the current situation. And when you know, when we try to explain, well, what causes genocide, it's important to understand that they do not just explode out of nowhere. Genocide is not an event. It's a process. It takes time, and there are many different forces operating during this time. Each and each society has what we call sources of escalation, sources that push for more and more violence. That can be people with, criminal, with violent tendencies, you know, nationalist politicians, you name it. But there are always also forces that push for restraint, forces that push against violence. So there is this constant at constant confrontation, constant tug of war between forces of escalation and forces of restraint. And usually, most of the time, forces of restraint are stronger than forces of escalation. And that's why genocide and mass violence are so rare. But once, for different reasons, when forces of escalation become stronger than the forces of restraint, that's when violence begins. And this constant confrontation is important to understand when we want to understand how to prevent genocide or how to stop them. There are many, there are two ways to do it. There is the fast way, which is much more common and that's what we have in mind when the violence begins, to stop the forces of escalation. Send troops, bomb them, use violence against perpetrators. But that's not the only way. Another way is to make the forces of restraint stronger, which is less visible, takes more time, usually involves things like investing in education or tolerance or promoting inclusive ideologies, but they are much more effective in the long term. Now, the question is, what causes 
those forces of escalation become stronger than the forces of restraint and under which conditions. And here we have two big types of arguments. One argument focuses on regime type. One of those arguments that focus on regime type says that authoritarian regimes are much more likely to engage in mass violence. Why? Well, because in authoritarian regime, the leader faces fewer constraints on their power. So there are no checks and balances as they exist in democracy. So if the leader decides to use violence, then there will be no one to stop them. Also, autocracies, in autocracies, violence against civilians is much more common than in democracies. Democracies, at least that's how the argument goes, are more liberal, they value human life, so they will think twice about killing civilians. And not surprisingly, the, the person who, also, who is associated most closely, closely with the idea that, sorry, that autocracies are more likely to have genocide is also the same person who is the founding father of the democratic peace theory that says that democracies do not fight each other for the same reason. It's just the same democratic peace theory, but instead of applying to states, it applies to civilians. Democra Democrats do not kill Democrats. That's one type of argument. There is another argument that pushes back against this idea and what it argues is that actually it's not autocracy, but democracy is much more likely to engage in mass violence, but not any democracy, just several of those. First of all, democracies that are engaged in state building, that's, that want to construct a new nation, and by doing so, they exclude outsiders. They exclude minorities, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, you know, linguistic minorities, and in the process of constructing this new state, they, this inclusion of minority spills over to mass violence. And that's why genocides do often happen in states that just emerge out of autocracies, like Yugoslavia in 1990s, or Rwanda, or even the Ottoman Empire. All democracies that have a very, what we call organic vision of the society, those who view society as a body of those who look the same, speak the same, think the same. And if you do not belong to this body because you speak a different language, or because of a, different, of a different skin color, then the state has absolutely no, no reason to keep you alive and no obligation to protect you. And in those, the end in those democracies, mass violence more likely. So what, so on balance, this argument is still ongoing, but what we do know the genocides do not happen in emerging, in established democracies. So they might happen in autocratic regimes, they might happen in emerging early democracies, but once democracy is established, then genocide is pretty much unthinkable. Another type of argument says, well, you know, forget about regimes. It's all about leaders. Because after all, genocide is not something that happens suddenly you need a leader or a group of leaders to decide on mass violence for it to happen. And what those people say that focus on leaders say that first of all, it's rational, it's not crazy. It's strategic, it's main, it is designed to achieve a goal. And it's never the first choice. No leader starts with the genocide. And oftentimes, it's just a result of desperation because everything else that has been tried does not work. So the argument goes like this. 
a leader has a problem. Now, from our perspective, this problem might be absolutely crazy, absolutely unthinkable, absolutely insane. But in their mind, it exists. And they try to solve this problem. But once or when they try to solve this problem, they use pretty rational standard means. They use, they use means that are designed to solve it. They evaluate, they go, they see what works. And if, and they never start with mass violence. They start with something slow, with something much lower, like force restrictions or forcing people to immigrate. If that does not work, they escalate to something more violent, see if that works. If that doesn't work, they escalate to something even more violence. And that's how only over time you get to genocide. So genocide is, genocide is never a first choice. Many things need to happen, need to happen for, gen for genocide to be. So those are in brief the two main types of arguments that we have to explain genocide. One that focuses on regime type, and one that focuses on leaders and their decision-making. And you know, after the lecture, I will be more than happy to discuss how those might or might not apply to what is right now in Ukraine. And that brings us to the case of Ukraine in 2022 and the current war, and how should we think about what's happening in Ukraine right now? And labels say, and the question that, uh, that I often get is, well, why does it so important whether we call it genocide or crimes against humanity or just war crimes and something else? I mean, after all, all those labels recognize that civilians die and it's a bad thing. And my answer is that labels do matter. Labels do matter for legal reasons because hopefully sometime from now, people will go to jail for the crimes they committed and they do want them to go for trial and to be tried for the crime of genocide rather than war crimes. It is important for political reasons. Genocide has, is a much more, is, is a much faithful, much more important, much more politically important term than war crimes or crimes against humanity, and we saw it in, and we saw it in April after Bucha, for instance. You know, before that, many people were talking about Russians committing war crimes or atrocity crimes or even crimes against humanity, and honestly, nobody cared. But then Bucha happened, and in early April the argument switched to that of genocide, and then everyone was paying attention. So just to, give you, just to give you an example, I think I was the first Western scholar to call it a genocide. I published an article in Washington Post immediately after Bucha saying that it is a genocide. And for the next week, the only thing I did was talking to people from the government and journalists from all over the world, literally they, you know, the entire day in chunks of 20 minutes because everyone was, because when people heard genocide, that's when they started paying attention. Before that, many people talked about war crimes and atrocities that the Russians committed, including myself, and nobody cared. But once you use the term genocide, you have this global attention. And when the same week after Bucha, President Biden called it the genocide, that's when they did. The, the language that people used in Washington and the US government also switched. So, so it's, it's unfair, it's unfortunate and it's unfair to you know, victims of crimes against humanity and atrocity crimes, but that's the reality. There is a hierarchy of crimes against civilians and genocide is at the very top. So politically calling the genocide if it qualifies matters. And there are, also more, there are also moral reasons for why it matters. Because genocide is a, crime, is a crime of crimes and societies that experience the genocide live with the effects of genocide for decades, if not centuries. And that's what 
unfortunately awaits Ukraine after this war is over. Ukraine will be a post-genocidal society and calling it a genocide and understanding what it is is, is important to prepare for the problems that will come after that and the impact of genocide on the, on the Ukrainian national identity and, and history and how Ukrainians think about what happened and also Russians by the way. So, so it's important, to, so the term is important and, and that's why it does matter. So what do we have in Ukraine? Well, crimes against humanity, of course. I don't think anyone in their right mind would, would dispute that there are crimes against humanity being committed by Russia in, against Ukrainian civilians. And what we see in Ukraine does fit those definitions. There is very high amounts of killing, rape, ethnic displacement, enslavement, and those are not random. It's an organized campaign. There is also, there is also, it's also pretty clear that atrocity crimes are being committed in Ukraine. Atrocity crimes include not just crimes against humanity, but also war crimes. So there is no doubt that those are happening. The question is genocide. Can we call what's happening in Ukraine a genocide? And here, what you have on the slide is once again the definition acts committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such by killing members of the group, causing bodily harm, preventing, uh, sorry, in, uh, creating conditions that would prevent a reproduction and transferring ch and children from one group to another, which we right now clearly see in the case of Ukrainian children from occupied territory being transferred to Russia. So should we call it a genocide? Well, the first question is, what is a targeted group? After all, there are four groups that are, that are being that are being that are covered by the convention: ethnic groups, national groups, racial and religious. It's pretty clear that a, that uh, racial and religious labels do not apply to the violence in Ukraine. But whether we can talk about targeting of a group, probably at least in my view, not on ethnic basis, because based on what we know about the victims of Russian violence, ethnicity doesn't matter. And even language for that matter matters less. But there are pretty good arguments to be made that the targeting is based on a national level. So people who are being killed are being killed not because of their ethnicity, not because they're Ukrainians or Russians or Tatars or Jews, but because they belong to Ukrainian national. And that what I think makes the genocide in Ukraine unique. In previous genocides, the mode of targeting was either racial or religious or ethnic. This I think is the first genocide when the targeting is based on purely national basis by belonging to a national identity group rather than another. To prove genocide, we need to prove intent. And, yet, and we do have statements of people like Putin who say that you know, Ukraine is not a real state and Ukrainians are not real people, they are just the French Russians. We have state media in Russia, which is producing clearly genocidal rhetoric almost on a, day, almost on a daily basis. And we also have some evidence from calls intercepted by the SBO where Russian soldiers do say that they were given orders to kill, to kill uh, not just uh, combatants, but also civilians. We have evidence from victims in places, uh, in places such as Kyiv, Oblast, where they talked about who got targeted. And we have types of violence that do fit the convention, mainly murder, killings of members of the group, and transfer of children of one group to another. So 
there are pretty strong arguments for calling it a genocide and for disclosure, I am fully in this camp. But that doesn't mean that, that the debate is settled. First, so the same, so when we look at the same criteria, a different type of argument can be made. What is the targeted group? Well, it's pretty clear that it's not an ethnic group and people who say that it is not a genocide would agree with that. What they would argue though, that we have no evidence that, is tar that targeting is done by a national basis, that there is an attempt to destroy a national group. Because the logic goes, if Putin and Russians do not believe that Ukrainians exist as a separate national group, then it's impossible to target them, to target them because of their belonging to this group. And we also have, and even more importantly, sorry, when it comes to intent, yes, we have clearly genocidal statements from people like Medvedev, but we know that Medvedev doesn't make any decisions. And there are clear genocidal statements in state media. But what we do not know is whether those statements and those discussions on state TV and whatever Medvedev might write in his Telegram channel has any effect on how Russian troops in Ukraine behave. In, in other words, we need to prove that there is an intent to destroy a group by those who are doing the killing. Not Medvedev, not you know, people in Moscow on state TV like Salaviyov or Simonan. Or Simonan, they don't matter. What matters is Putin, who does talk about Ukraine not being a real state and Ukrainians not being a real nation, but he did not say explicitly, well, we should destroy this group. And we do not know enough about why Russian troops kill. We might never know enough. Because for that, we need to have access to Russian documents and to Russian perpetrators. So we might never know why they kill. They, of course, have all the, all the reasons to say that they did not kill civilians or when they killed, they killed only those who were suspected as combatants. So we do not, so, so the other side of this debate is that, you know, might be there are some components of genocide, but we still don't know enough. We don't have enough data. And the same goes for the same goes for the type of violence, right? We need to prove that those people who are killed in Bucha, Mariupol, in other places were killed because there was an intent to destroy a national group. That he that children from occupied territories were transferred to Russia because there was an intent to Russify, to Russify them and make Russians out of them rather than just saving orphans. So what the other side says that, you know, what we might discover in 10 years, 20 years, when we have all the documents that there was a genocide, but for now, we just do not have enough evidence and we need to be cautious, especially when it comes to people, to trying people, to, to crime people for the crime of genocide, because we need to have this legal evidence. The problem though, at least for me, is that if we need to wait years and decades to figure out what happened then, we, then we should be talking about how to stop a genocide or how to prevent a genocide. We can't wait 10 years and have all the documents to stop, to stop a genocide that is already going. So, so when, when people like myself who say that it is a genocide, make those arguments, yeah, I can't speak for everyone, but I personally realize that, you know, we still don't know, we still don't have the entire picture. And there might be some documents that will emerge later on that will prove uh, me right, or maybe prove me wrong. But for now, I'm willing to take this risk and say that based on what we see, there are good reasons to call it a genocide. So then, since we're out of time, where do we stand? What is genocide? 
Genocide is an organized attempt to destroy a group because of its group identity. Does it happen in Ukraine? I think it is, and I think that there are very good reasons to believe that it is happening. The question is why? Well, here, going back to our discussion about two main causes, it's pretty clear that regime type, at least in my view, plays a role in Russian actions in Ukraine. It's pretty clear that the lack of constraints on Putin and the Russian government, and also the normalization of violence within Russia and throughout recent Russian history does contribute to what we see in Ukraine. What we do know yet is Putin's exact decision. In other words, if there was an explicit order to commit this genocide, then what caused it and how it has been arrived at? We might never know, but that's for us to understand the causes of genocide, unless we can manage to get into Putin's head or to get access to the exact documents that brought to the decision to invade in February or to start killing civilians in North, especially in Northern Ukraine, places like Kiev Oblast, we might never, we might never know. So I will probably stop here. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Дякуємо дуже за таку інформативну лекцію. І, шановне панство, я запрошую до дискусії, хто має бажання задати питання. Окей. Ігоре, давайте. So, uh, first of all, thank you for the election, Mr. Finkel. And uh, I have a question. So, can we introduce words uh, as uh, cultural genocide and the psychological genocide? Because uh, as for uh, cultural genocide, uh, let's remember destroying uh, Grigory Skovardas uh, National Museum and the uh, Ukrainian National Library in Genitive region. And as for uh, psychological genocide, uh, it means um, psychological changing or uh, something empty in uh, their mind, in their victims. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so, okay, so, yeah, now I will answer, I will answer in English. Uh, so, so when it comes to, you know, how to call it to genocide with adjectives, what we call, the problem, well, it's not a problem. It's the reality that, you know, we have this legal definition, it is binding, but most of us are unhappy with it because we understand that it is limited. Now, originally for Lemkin, destruction of culture was a clear part of genocide. There was no question about that. And actually when he talked about the destruction of culture, he was explicitly talking about what Soviets did in Ukraine like, during the Holodomor or, or the, the, the murder of Renaissance and uh, you know, persecution of the Greek Catholic Church in Western Ukraine. So for him, originally there was no question that destruction of culture is a part is a key part of genocide because without culture, without identity, there is no group. You don't have to kill members of the group to destroy a group. Destroy their culture and in the long term, the results will be the same. Unfortunately for United Nations, cultural genocide was not enough. They were, you know, they were politicians. They wanted something that they could see and measure, like killing members of the group and also Soviet Union was, uh, was one of the powers that decided on the convention, so the cultural part was left out. But there are still, there are still states who use the term cultural genocide when it comes to destruction of identity. So for instance, Canada. And 
In Canada, the treatment of First Nations, the, the native population is legally considered a cultural genocide. Now, I'm not familiar with other states who use it officially, there might be, but it, it is definitely a term. For me, I would say the destruction of culture just goes under the definition of genocide. Yes, it's not enough to put you know, perpetrators in jail, but it goes hand in hand with all the other things and the goal is the same, to, dis to destroy a nation. In terms of psychological genocide, honestly, I haven't heard this term before. I don't even know how to treat it because after all, genocide is, genocide applies to groups. And I don't, I'm not sure how we can reconcile you know, psychological effects which differ from one individual to another to, at, at the group level. So, so I, I would just say that I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know, but cultural genocide, definitely. Okay, thank you for your answer. Дякую, Яна, будь ласка. Good day. First of all, I was extremely happy to the hear your Ukrainian is very nice. Is uh, I'm very happy. Um, uh, my uh, question, um, let's say, is not an either one. Uh, Germany has had a drill against um, to the quality of the genocide of the Jews and to uh, Crimean Tatars. Uh, we still remember this horror that um, happened then, uh, from movies and uh, history. And uh, here is the Ukrainian analog of uh, Butch and uh, Mariupol. I was um, in that city with a volunteer mission, and um, what you see, this is not to be wished upon the enemies. As um, far uh, as is known, not everyone was uh, punished for the Holocaust, and uh, court cannot always give the correct punishment. Uh, how many more such terrible events will have to happen so that world leaders will finally start to act mm -hmm. at the beginning of such ter ter terrorist attacks against humanity uh, when really effort control opportunities will be uh, created so that such events do not happen again or uh, at least the quality uh, punished fairly? Right. So, so how is uh, so you are talking about two things, both prevention it's and all prevention. Yeah. Now, prevention. You know, honestly, it's not a, it's not a question to me. It's as you said, the question for leaders. And to be absolutely honest, I'm very skeptical about prevention. I do not think we can prevent genocide because it requires the levels of political will that most leaders simply do not have. Punishment and accountability is a different story. So you're right that in Nuremberg, no one was uh, convicted of the crime of genocide in part because the word was so new and the trials happened before there was a convention. But right now we do have cases of people being punished for the crime of genocide in the International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia, or International Criminal Court for Rwanda, even in the even in domestic uh, in domestic legal system, and it's something that the International Criminal Court has as part as part of its powers. Now, let's not overestimate it. Those cases are very few, and it takes years to prepare such a case and to try it. And usually it goes only after the top perpetrators, if they can be arrested and brought to trial. So, so you now looking forward, how many people might be punished for the crime of genocide in Ukraine? How many Russian perpetrators? At the international courts, probably very few. I'm just, unfortunately, I'm realistic about 
But that doesn't mean that the domestic criminal system in Ukraine cannot deal with those with those cases. And I know that they that the prosecutor general office is working on on some on some of the on some of those cases. Now, obviously, the perpetrators need to be first captured. So we're talking about more lower level perpetrators who become prisoners of war. But you know, I'm probably dreaming, I'm probably very naive, but I hope that at some point we will get to a point where Russian domestic criminal system will be able to punish those people. Now, how likely it is again, you know, I'm probably being very naive, but maybe in some distant future. So, so, so prevention probably not going to happen in the future. And if it does happen, we will not know about it because nothing happened. Punishment, there will be some. I'm sure there will be, but again, unfortunately, not many cases. Дякую. У нас ще є змога задати одне питання. Валерій, якщо ви дуже коротко, тому що нам треба вже дякувати і відпускати пана професора. Добре, я швидко. Доброго вечора. Точніше дня. Таке питання. В історії Сидянних Штатів були випадки теракту, нападу превентивного. І з усіх випадків всі, е, ці загрози були швидко знешкоджені, тобто е, країна швидко знайшла винних і е, знайшла змогу, як вирішити свою загрозу. Чому українці мають е, доказувати свою, свій геноцид? У мене все. So I don't think it's uh, so. It's a good question, and you know I understand, uh, you know your motivation for asking. It, but it's, it's so. It's not. It's not just Ukraine. So genocide is almost impossible to prove as it happens. And in fact, when it comes to the Russian genocide in Ukraine, the job is so much easier to prove it than in other cases, simply because they're so open about what they're doing, right? So, so imagine without the Russian state media talking day and night about, you know, about destroying Ukrainians as a nation or Medvedev writing what he writes in his Telegram channel. I don't think we would be even talking about, you know, any ability to prove intent. And, you know, I studied this thing for, almost 20 years and never thought that, you know, there would be a state that would almost advertise genocide. But that's what Russians are doing. So, so in fact, in fact, making a, making a strong argument for why it, is, it happens right now in Ukraine is much easier compared to cases such as, say, Bosnia, where it took years and years and still unsettled, or Rohingya in Myanmar, that it also took years and years. Genocide is almost impossible to prove as it happens. Ukraine is actually, Ukraine is actually an exception here. Я дуже дякую вам, пане професор, за надзвичайно цікаву тему, за ваші дискусії, дискусію і ми б хотіли ще вам мільйон питань позадавати, я та впевнена і викладачі, але час завершено, вичерпано ліміт. Дякую, можливо, ще колись буде змога і ми зможемо задати свої питання, хоча б онлайн. Дякую вам дякую. дуже. Дякую, до побачення. До побачення. Дякуємо.